if not the youngest, I was pretty close to one of the youngest people in the room, uh, and I'm way out uh, class in that in this room. And it's really, really wonderful to see so many young people and to hear about so much great science uh, that, that the mission has been able to do. So I'm going to give a bit of an overview of some of the observations program, <coughs> why we had to do it. Uh, uh, it's a bit of a philosophical talk in that sense. Um, so I just wanted to start with that it's, it's hard to believe, but uh, uh, before Kepler launched in uh, early 2009, uh, there were 415 known uh, exoplanets, and this is their distribution in mass uh, and period space, and I very specifically put uh, this in, ma in mass uh, space because every single one of these objects uh, had a mass that were known because most of the discoveries were done by radio velocities. But there were a sample of 58 transiting exoplanets uh, that were discovered, um, uh, mostly from the ground, but also from Corot. Uh, but every single one of these had masses, and that is because when they were discovered by the transits, we went and got radio velocities. That was the standard at the time uh, in order to uh, go from a transiting uh, exoplanet candidate to a confirmed planet. So you would actually go and get masses of the transiting uh, candidates. And then Kepler happened, and this is, of course, jumping to the end. This is all of the uh, candidates. And now I've shifted uh, into uh, planetary radius uh, versus orbital period. These are the, these are the same uh, pre-launch uh, transiting planets uh, and, uh, and the radio. You can see they're all very large planets. But the majority of the things that Kepler was finding uh, uh, were much, were significantly smaller. So we needed to be able to handle these in a very different way. Because the predicted radio velocity signatures for the majority of these planets were well below a few meters per second. Uh, and in fact, if you go and look today at the confirmed uh, Kepler planets, only 10% of them actually have mass estimates. Uh, and not all of those were done with radio velocities. Uh, a good significant fraction of those were done with uh, uh, transit timing variations. And so Kepler really blazed the trail in trying to get rid of the astrophysical false positives, right? The whole concept of statistically validating the, the transiting planet candidates uh, came out of necessity because we got to Kepler 9, if you look at Willie's paper, and it's too small to get radio velocities of, and we had to come up with a way to say at the 99.999 whatever percent level that we believe that this is an actual true transiting uh, planetary candidate. And there was an entire talk that Tim gave earlier in the week describing you know, just the, the, the scene change to do all that. So in order, to, in order to support the validation and in order to be able to get rid of, um, statistically get rid of the astrophysical false positives, we needed to establish a significant ground program. So like I said at the beginning, before, before Kepler, the ground program was all about radio velocities. The ground program actually became much more intensive after that because the radio velocity detections were no longer possible. And so there's an entire ground set program that was intended to characterize the star, vet out the false positives, and then eventually validate uh, the candidate itself. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, a lot of what, what we did as a funded follow-up program, but the community as a whole made enormous contributions to the process, both in terms of imaging and spectroscopy, uh, and if you, if you were able to count up all the telescopes around the world that were used uh, to do this, almost in the Northern Hemisphere for Kepler, it's an enormous task that the community took on. And so I'm going to talk about, it's really a tale of two follow-up programs. One is Kepler and one is K2, and I actually split them out a little bit separately because they are different. And one of the big things that was different between Kepler and K2 is that for Kepler, the project produced a set of light curves and it produced a set of candidates and had a small, dedicated, funded follow-up program. Um, and there were community contributions along the way that were utilized, but the dedicated program was actually
actually really critical to moving uh, moving the validation process forward because we took it upon ourselves as we interact with the community to try to figure out how we wanted to do this. And I would like to point out there were only really five groups uh, that were that were involved in the small uh, funded program. And by the time we got to the end of the observations in 2015, we collectively had spent more than 3,000 nights at the telescope. And I personally spent more than 300 nights at the telescope. So this was a huge and, and uh, dedicated effort, and that's only a fraction of what the community did as a whole. All right, so what we try to do, the very first thing you have to do is you want to understand the star, because the transit depth uh, that you measure is just the ratio of the planet radius to the stellar radius. So one thing that absolutely has to happen is that you need to understand the stellar radius well enough to get a good uh, planetary radius out of the out of the observed transit depth. This is one of my favorite examples of uh, why you want to do this. This came out early on in the mission. This is Kepler 21. We were all super excited about this object when it came out. It was a bright star. Uh, and we thought it was about the size of the sun, and that the planet was about the size of the Earth. After the spectroscopy, the planet, the, the planet became significantly larger because we figured out that the star was slightly evolved, and that the, uh, uh, the planet is much more like a super-Earth than, rather than like an Earth. Interestingly, of course, it wasn't until, I think it was last year, that Mercedes Lopez Morales finally published a paper with the mass of this object, because it took for an uh, enormous amount of effort to try to get to get this object. But that was the one of the first lessons in you really need to understand the stellar radius if you're going to understand the planet radius. And so there was an entire effort to deal with the uh, spectroscopic parameters. Uh, um, uh, one of the things that we did as a program is that we observed a set of common stars between the different programs. So there were 615 stars which we used as standards. And one of the really interesting things that came out of this was that uh, different groups doing the same stars with different instruments and slightly different pipelines and slightly different models get slightly different results. And the reason that's important, the reason I bring that up, is that with a temperature spread of a uh, few hundred degrees, or a temperature spread of you know something like 10%, uh, that translates into 5 to 10%, that translates into radii differences of, of uh, 5 to 10% squared. And so we worked, uh, this, is the, this is the final, sort of the final catalog that, uh, that Civita led, uh, and I just want to point out that uh, the observing that the thought did were these stars, and yet the community contributed an enormous amount of of information with regards to uh, cell parameters. The point here is what is that the project funded a series of, of observing, but we worked together as a community to put this all together. And I think that's really crucial, and that uh, that legacy is carries forward. And of course, Guy took this to the next level. This comes out of Travis's paper from from last year. And while this is based on Gaia data, as was mentioned earlier in the week, um, the the temperatures were actually taken from Savita's paper in order to derive the stellar radii and the, um, and the planet radii. And so while this was based strongly on Gaia, it used the work that the follow-up programs provided. But of course, it's more complicated than this. Uh, this was talked about uh, earlier in the week, that if, there's, uh, if there are other stars in the aperture, that the, oops, I'm sorry, that the observed depth is actually too shallow because the because the light the light from the third from this other star dilutes the transit and so your actual true uh, transit is is uh, and planet radius is related to the fact that you have uh, this flux dilution and so if you don't take that into account if there's another star there uh, you can underestimate the planet radius if the stars if the blends are nearly equal in brightness then the then the dilution is about one and a half, and that sort of asymptotically goes to unity as the, star, as the second star gets fainter and fainter and fainter, as, you, as one would expect. But the presence of that star also brings into question, well, which star 
does the planet orbit. And if the planet is actually orbiting the other star, you can actually greatly underestimate the uh, planet radius you get out because you have assumed that the planet orbits the primary when in fact it might actually orbit the secondary. And so my favorite example of this is Kepler, uh, or KOI uh, 2626. We were enormously excited about this object. It was, a, it was an M star. Uh, the planet size was about the size of a terrestrial object, and it had an equilibrium, equilibrium temperature expected to be about 230 degrees. I went to Keck, took about 30 seconds to figure out that the star is actually a triple, and uh, now we had completely underestimated the size of the planet radius uh, by a factor of two. And so we went from a terrestrial size object to a super Earth. Uh, or a mini Neptune, uh, and now it just changed dramatically uh, the properties that we thought of the system. So, getting the high resolution imaging was absolutely critical to really understanding the planet properties and the, and the distribution of uh, planetary radii. And there was a dedicated effort within the Kepler FOP itself, but then the, also the community. Uh, contributed an enormous amount of data on this. And this is a, this is a plot that comes out of Elise Froman's paper uh, where she compiled not only our imaging results, but um, all, all the imaging results that have been published in the literature uh, at that time. It's actually even grown since then um, as people continue to work uh, in the field. And by the time we got to the end of this, uh, nearly 100%, oops, I'm sorry, Nearly 100% of the KOIs uh, were observed with at least some kind of high resolution imaging technique. And so I just really want to highlight there was this, there was this, you know, there was this dedicated effort, uh, and uh, the community contributed an enormous amount. Um, Kepler was very different than K2. I don't want to run out of time here. Uh, uh, and the primary difference was that. The community had to produce the light curves, and the community had to produce their planetary candidates. Um, and there was no funded up follow-up program, and so the community came together in kind of a way to uh, they formed loose collaborations, and they were highly competitive. And there was an enormous amount of uh, duplicated effort uh, in terms of going to the telescope, observing the same same objects. But slowly, after the initial competition, people realized that they were competing against each other. And they began to, to collaborate and to work together and actually share resources and not just try to beat each other up. And I think the combination of the experience from Kepler and K2 uh, led to an enormous amount of sharing of data. So all this is available on the XFL. Um, uh, today, it's all available to everybody. But the point is that the community came together to share their data and their results partly because the Kepler project shared their data and results, and partly because K2 uh, uh, had this strong competition that then led to people trying to figure out a way to work collaboratively and work together. And I think, in the end, the final true legacy of the Kepler K2 follow-up program is the social change that, that occurred, and now we have this larger community-wide follow-up program for tests. And we're, all, we're only six months into the mission. There's only 400 candidates listed. And there are already thousands of files and observations that people are sharing with each other and the community. And I think this is a real sea change in our, in, our, in our community. We're still highly competitive. We're still going to try to beat each other out. We're still going to try to do the best science. But we're also sharing and working collaboratively because we know that the data that we're taking has a long-lasting legacy and value. And I just want to say thank you to all of my collaborators uh, and all of the community members over these years. Working with each and every one of you has just been a thrill of a lifetime for the last 10 years. Thank you.